Hello everybody and welcome back to the Well Woman podcast. It is such a delight to share this information with you. This episode is called A Natural Approach to Iron Deficiency, Nourishing the Sea of Blood. Hi, I'm Sue Lindsay and this is the Well Woman podcast. I've worked with countless women and teenage girls over the years as a natural women's health clinician. And I know how hard it can be to get the help you need to overcome hormonal imbalance, infertility, and perimenopausal symptoms. I bring together my expertise in natural medicine and nutrition with insights from experts in the field of women's wellness to help you get the information you need to make a real difference to your health. This truly unique podcast combines the wisdom of the East with the clinical know-how of modern naturopathy offering a holistic approach to empower and inspire women just like you on the path to optimized health. I'm your trusted guide as you navigate your hormone healing journey, giving you support, accountability, and guidance along the way. Thanks for listening in, and don't forget to follow or subscribe. It's time to nourish you with Well Woman. In Oriental medicine, there are five vital substances in the body. So we have the chi, of course. We have all of the body fluids. We have essence, which there is a similar concept in Ayurveda when we talk about urjas. But for Western medicine, it's like an essential fluid substance that is there with you at the time that you're born and continues, hopefully, to be regenerated throughout your lifetime then we have the spirit and finally we have blood and they coexist in this internal landscape of constant activation and transformation there is warming there is defense and there is also containment of all of these vital substances but there's something very special about blood in all holistic healing systems, because it's in our blood that we carry the breath of life through oxygen. And the blood also carries essential trace elements like iron atoms, packaged up neatly in absolutely tiny red cells. This is how iron becomes intimately engaged in our life force, in our energy, and in our vigor. Did you know that we produce two to four trillion of these red blood cells in our bone marrow every second? For menstruation, for women, your body prepares your uterus and its lining each and every cycle, building and nourishing it with lots of blood, just in case you conceive, at which point this sea of blood will become the life-sustaining fluid for your baby or your babies. That's how rich and nutritive it is. And with each menstrual cycle, we might lose around 30 mil, 30, 30 mil of pure blood on average. That's equivalent to somewhere between 126 to 162 million red blood cells, and each of those red blood cells containing iron. So we do lose a chunk of our iron every time that we bleed. And even more if we suffer from heavy bleeds. So in order for iron to be beneficial and useful to our bodies, we need to maintain our bodily iron levels within a certain range. Not too little, not too much. While our bodies are naturally geared to absorb iron, they're actually also designed to sometimes prevent absorption when the levels are perceived as dangerously high. And your body will control this by intestinal absorption of iron. It will carefully regulate the iron levels and iron absorption so that it can maintain what's known as iron homeostasis, which is basically a healthy balance and level of iron in your body. Your liver also plays a role in iron regulation. It will produce chemicals to suppress iron absorption. And a good example of this is the protein Hepcidin, this is called the master regulator of iron metabolism. And so what happens when we don't have enough iron in our blood? What are the signs to look out for and how would you test for it? 
In this episode, you'll learn about iron deficiency. It is essentially the most common nutrient deficiency in the world and iron deficiency anemia. And you'll learn some practical dietary strategies to get your life force back by nourishing your own sea of blood. If you have iron deficiency, this means you don't get enough iron in your body to meet your physiological needs. Iron, it's involved in oxygen delivery to your cells, so you can immediately see how essential and crucial iron is just for our life force. It's also involved in manufacture of energy, so that's part of that process, getting oxygen into cells and enabling this process of energy metabolism to take place. It's involved in cellular growth. So this is also why at certain life phases and stages of our lives, we will need more iron when we're little, when we're preschoolers and toddlers and young children, we will need more iron to be able to just simply grow. And iron is involved in lots of enzymatic reactions in the body as well. So as a result, low iron levels will impact your oxygen status and they will physically deplete you. And then you'll get this declining oxygen and energy supply to your muscles. And it can also mean that you get a compromised immune system because iron is involved in this defense. So your immune system won't be able to gear up and to strengthen itself in the face of invading pathogens, infections, and that sort of thing. You might also get some heightened nervous tension feelings of dizziness or breathlessness, and maybe your mood will be impacted as well. Your body essentially will tell you if your iron is inadequate. Think about it like all of the symptoms that you get on a daily basis. They are simply just signals from your body. They're trying to tell you or warn you or alert you to the fact that something's out of balance or something is missing in your body, missing some vital components. Really good example is things like vitamin B6 or magnesium, just essential nutrients that we need for many of the metabolic reactions in our bodies. Or maybe we have an adequate hormone, so we might be having issues with our menstrual cycles or fertility and things like that. So your body will come up with all of these warning signals for you. And it's interesting when you look at iron, at least the ones that I see presenting in clinic quite frequently, they will be very cardiovascular style symptoms. Now, this makes sense when you think about iron and what its job is and how it operates because it works with the cardiovascular system. It lives in the cardiovascular system, moving within red blood cells, in the, in the blood vessels and delivering oxygen to cells. That is essentially what the cardiovascular system is uh, all about, really. So many of the symptoms of iron deficiency will remind you of things like uh, dizziness, maybe the weakness, the fatigue, difficulty concentrating. It really all feels like you're in this deficiency state. And in traditional Chinese medicine, they would see a condition like anemia as a blood deficiency condition or syndrome. So you might feel fatigued, you might feel lethargic, you may experience this dizziness that is like a lightheadedness. It also can be quite hard to focus and concentrate when you have iron deficiency. And as you move around, you may feel like you have shortness of breath. So that breathlessness that can make you feel, oh, but you know, I'm puffing now. I guess then in that sense, you can see how it would impact on exercise capability as well. So where you'd normally be able to exercise uh, at a certain level with a sense of vigor and strength. And then suddenly when you become iron deficient or anemic, you discover that suddenly your exercise endurance is not as good. You can't push yourself as much as you used to. So a real sign that you're just not getting that oxygen into your cells. I'll see the fatigue and the dizziness in pretty much most of my clients who come in with iron deficiency. So it is those are the two symptoms that I often will not really have to screen for very hard. They'll be quite obvious. And I usually assess energy levels and look at how energy changes and transforms throughout the day for all of my clients just to see whether or not there are indications there of cardiovascular conditions and so on. So I, when I ask my clients about energy levels, I'm, I'm interested in more than just the energy level, uh, if you see what I mean. I'm interested in the patterns and the trends with energy and metabolism. 
You can also feel a little bit weak. You could find that your skin can suffer from this pallor or paleness. And the cold hands and feet, that's another um, key sign of iron deficiency. Now, the cold hands and feet, I find it less specific, even though it is one of the key symptoms of iron deficiency. I don't always rely on that alone. So I will be looking for other signs of iron deficiency, such as the uh, the fatigue and the dizziness. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about these, um, you know, again, further in the podcast. But the cold hands and feet, I just want to mention that it's one of those symptoms that can also relate to the adrenals. If the adrenals are really spent and, and working really hard, uh, lots of energy and blood going into the center of the body and pulling away from the peripherals. Now, that is a little bit of a survival mode that the body can go into. So the cold hands and feet would be a typical symptom there. Also, it could be poor circulation. It could just simply be that the person's not moving around enough, not getting the physical exercise, sedentary lifestyle. And there can be other reasons why someone might have poor circulation. So I do look at cold peripherals, but I don't rely on them alone. One of the things I do notice actually in iron deficient younger women and teens as well is being dark under the eyes. So I do look around the eyes or typically do facial diagnosis and have a look at what that can tell me because I guess we're trying to get as much data as we can on all the possible signs that iron deficiency may be present. And if you just very gently um, look at the lower lid of your eyes, you can detect whether there is an adequate blood supply through there. And uh, that's a very, very simple thing to do actually, but have a Google, have a look um, on the internet and see if you can see some videos showing this. But basically if you pull down very gently on the lower lid and you're looking at the area of tissue that's just between the lower eyelid and the eyeball and it will look very pale in iron deficiency. And then recurrent infections. So that's another one. People who normally are pretty robust with their immunity will come in and say, I keep getting sick all the time and I feel like my immune system's not functioning all that well. Then we remember that, oh, yes, iron is part of the defense mechanism. It works with the immune system. So there is likely to be a link there between iron deficiency and recurrent coughs and colds and even gastric infections, things like that. There are some other symptoms that I'll mention. They're interesting ones too. I wonder if you know you suffer from some of these. So one of them is restless leg syndrome. I do get this at times and I have had a history of iron deficiency. So restless leg syndrome is the most annoying thing. You, If you can imagine, um, and you don't experience this, but if you can just imagine that your legs, you almost have to move them. You don't want to, but you're jerking and moving them around. It's the most, this feeling like there's something inside your body that is making you jerk. And restless leg syndrome is now associated with iron deficiency. Certainly, I wasn't aware of this for a while. I was almost always wondering, you know, where is this restless leg syndrome coming from? But there you go. So if you do suffer from restless leg syndrome, it might be worthwhile looking into the possibility of iron deficiency. And then there's the hair loss. So hair loss, again, not very specific. I wouldn't rely on it on its own, but this is significant hair loss, not the 100 or so hairs that we all lose every day, but significant hair loss coming out in clumps, that sort of thing or you die of shock when you brush your hair and you see what's on your brush. Uh, so that type of hair loss, I think, could potentially be many things, including adrenal stress and strain, chronic illness, and so on, but also could relate to iron deficiency. Some of the other symptoms quoted in the literature as iron deficiency signs include dry mouth and heart palpitations. And then there's iron deficiency anemia. So the term anemia comes from the Greek word anemi, and it means a lack of blood. So it means that you don't have enough blood cells, and it's gone beyond not just having enough iron in your cells. There will be low levels of hemoglobin in this case, low red blood cell count as well, and the most common trigger or cause to anemia is iron deficiency. With anemia, it is a more complex level of impact here. So it usually involves multiple systems in the body and all of your tissues. 
So at this stage where you're starting to get this iron deficiency permeating into your different body systems, including your hormonal systems, you can end up with problems with fertility and hormonal health can be compromised as well. You can get disrupted menstrual cycles. You can get periods that are starting to become very light. And just if you think about it, you are, yes, lacking in blood. So you're going to be lacking in blood to service the menstrual period as well. And the periods could even become absent. A pregnancy can occur in anemia. It's not that it can't occur, but anemia would be a problem for natural fertility. So it's something that you would want to address. But let's say that you were anemic, you became pregnant. It can then increase the risk of things like a low birth weight for your baby or a risk of preterm delivery for your baby as well. There is some increased risks with things like preeclampsia or bleeding in the mother during pregnancy. And it's kind of sobering to think that around 20% of maternal deaths are caused by iron shortage. So there is a lot that we can do to ensure better pregnancy and birth outcomes just by looking at this most simple element of iron. And I really like to make sure that my fertility clients, especially if they're vegan or vegetarian, uh, that they have their iron needs met prior to conceiving. So that's part of that 100-day preconception planning and eating and living in a way that is building and nourishing this sea of blood. So if you're wondering, you know, why did I call this the sea of blood? If you are familiar with Chinese medicine, you will understand this. I know I'm a, I'm a naturopath. I have studied Chinese herbal medicine, but I am a naturopath. And I really like this concept of the sea of blood from Chinese medicine. So they believe that throughout the menstrual cycle, when a woman is building up the menstrual blood, that it is being filtered and pulled and gathered in the body. And the liver has a very strong role in this, which is why menstrual problems often will have some sort of liver association. You know, for instance, liver becoming stagnated or liver flow of blood is not going very well, that sort of thing. So the sea of blood is the term that's given to the blood that has collected and pulled throughout the cycle and is then going to be released. Maybe it's going to be released or maybe it's going to become the blood that nourishes the, the new baby. So back to anemia. Anemia can be also associated with vitamin B12 deficiency. It may not be just iron that you need to look at here. There's also vitamin A deficiency. Interestingly, also vitamin A associations with thyroid function and being able to produce your thyroid hormones and absorb your thyroid nutrients. And iron is an important nutrient for thyroid hormone production as well. And some other things that might contribute to anemia are parasitic infections. Chronic inflammation is another one there. And sometimes it's an inherited condition. So there's a few things that you can investigate if you think that, you know, you may be not just iron deficient, but moving into anemic territory. Start looking at the vitamin B12, the vitamin A. Look at your diet and see whether your diet contains foods that are going to give you good enough or suitable levels of these vitamins. You know, Look at your diet and think, is this diet rich enough in my vitamin B12, in my iron, of course, in all of my vitamin Bs? Is it rich enough in vitamin C, which is so important for iron absorption, and vitamin A? should be in there as well. So iron deficiency is a lack of iron and iron deficiency anemia is a lack of red blood cells. Both of them ideally would be addressed through diet as well as supplementation, especially if it's gotten to the anemia stage. According to the uh, Australian Iron Deficiency Expert Group, Around 15% of non-pregnant women in reproductive age, so we're talking here like 18 to 50, have anemia. So that's 15% of that population. And 12% of pregnant women in Australia have anemia. So it's quite high numbers, isn't it, in terms of the women who would be suffering from this sort of condition that's impacting their daily ability to move, exercise, think and function you know, use their cognition and get everything done that they need to do within a day. And then there are about 8% of preschool children in Australia who have anemia. About 1% to 6% of toddlers in Sydney and Adelaide are anemic. It's just coming from one study that was a bit more specific for those cities, Sydney, Adelaide. 
And um, interestingly, the anemia is actually higher in the toddlers of Asian descent, actually sits around the 14% mark, which, yeah, yeah, interesting, isn't it? It's more than double what you see in the general average for toddlers in those cities. Anemia is also really common in indigenous communities, a lot higher, actually. There was a study of an Aboriginal community in Western Australia, and they found that 55% of women were anemic, 18% of men were anemic. So they're really, really high stats. Now, because we were looking, thinking before, you know, 15% of non-pregnant women, reproductive age, compared to 55% of women in Indigenous communities. And for all Australians over the age of 65 years old, anemia affects around 10% of women and 11% of men. So you start to see the levels evening up there because after the age of menopause for women, we don't need to worry so much about losing our iron through our menstrual periods. So the risk of iron deficiency and anemia will reduce for us at that stage. I came across a paper which was published, or should I say a, an article which was published by the Scientific American in 2021. So this is a couple of years ago. It was called The Global Iron Deficiency Crisis. I thought it was a fantastic paper. It gave a lot of stats. So if you're interested, have a look at that. I can put the link into the show notes. All of the references and sources that I've used to assist me in compiling this podcast, by the way, they are available. So you can always ask, please feel free to reach out. So they shared a lot of interesting aspects of iron deficiency, including things like what are the health consequences of iron deficiency for pregnant women and their babies? So relating back to things that I was saying before about preeclampsia, low birth weight, they all came from that particular paper. Globally, iron deficiency affects around 2.4 billion people. And if it then rolls on to become iron deficiency anemia, it affects around 1.2 billion people. So we've got roughly twice as many people with iron deficiency as we do with anemia. And with a world population of 8 billion, you can see that's over 25% of us. And I'd say the real figures could even be a lot higher than that because it doesn't include the people who don't know that they're iron deficient or haven't yet had a blood test to prove or reveal that they are iron deficient. So let's talk about iron and why it's so important for us. We obtain various micronutrients that are crucial for maintaining a healthy hormone balance from the foods that we consume. And we hope that when we're eating, we're actually eating for health. And one of those vital elements is iron. Iron plays a very central role in the formation of proteins, which are called hemoglobin. And that will be a familiar term if you've ever been iron deficient or anemic and you've looked at tests or you've had test results and you've seen hemoglobin featuring in those. So hemoglobin proteins are basically transporting oxygen throughout our bodies via the bloodstream. And this is why we experience fatigue, which is actually the most common symptom of iron deficiency if our iron levels are insufficient. Because each of those hemoglobin molecules is composed of a number of things, including four iron atoms. So oxygen gets taken up in these molecules, and that's how the oxygen gets distributed to the rest of your body, traveling in these hemoglobin molecules. And every cell in our body relies on oxygen. Can you imagine life without oxygen? Every cell in your whole body, your tissues, your organ systems and everything is relying on the hemoglobin to bring the oxygen in to effectively metabolize glucose for energy and for life force. And this oxygen is housed actually inside the iron atoms, which are then housed inside each of the hemoglobin molecules. So I want to just highlight why iron is so important for women. And I'm not saying it's not important for everybody, all the boys, all the men, but there is this uh, very strong affinity between iron and women's bodies and the way women's bodies are built. So physiologically, women's bodies are blood and earth bodies, and blood is the energetic foundation of a woman's health. In a literature review, 2014, I think it was published, on the ancient and holistic perspectives on women's health, researchers concluded that a woman's health, her sickness, even her treatment outcomes 
are all deeply influenced by how well nourished and regulated her blood is. And that treatments like herbal medicine and acupuncture are just so effective for women's hormone balance, for fertility, because they regulate the flow of blood through the uterus and ovaries. So you see that strong association between blood health and a woman's hormonal health. And symptoms like strong period pain, they're directly related to disturbed menstrual blood flow. You know, this is essentially, by the way, a bit of a Taoist approach, Chinese Taoism. And Chinese medicine considers anemia, that condition of deficient blood, but with a conception of blood that is a lot more nuanced than we have in the West. You know, so I'm going to weave some of these concepts into the discussion here because I think these more holistic perspectives on a woman's physiological makeup are really useful when we're talking about things like iron deficiency. And as women, we have this very intimate relationship with blood. The way that we build and cleanse and store and release our blood cyclically for a very good portion of our lifespan. In Oriental medicine, they say women are blood, men are yang which reflects the earthly qualities of childbirth, menstruation. It's, you know, this blood, it's what makes our muscles so red. It lines our uterus. Our babies are born with a coat of iron-rich blood. And in medical manuals in the East, since over a thousand years ago, they say, or they always say the difficulty of curing women's disorders has been because of their so-called bloody nature. So women and blood are sort of, you know, they go together. And no doubt, beliefs like this have ended up shaping cultural attitudes to menstruation and women's bodies as well. I know we'll see this in various religions and different types of cultures. And you know, blood became this differentiating point between female and male bodies and conditions. And if you look at the way women's conditions are described, the language often relates to things like the flow of blood. So blockages, stagnation, condensing, in period pain, for example, clotting, direction of flow, conditions like endometriosis, the, the changing direction of flow of blood in the body, and heaviness of blood in menorrhagia. So it's very blood-oriented. And so many women's disorders are blood-specific. So to think about the iron sitting in our blood and how essential it is to all of our functions and our reproductive capacity also to our energy, our focus, our body temperature, and how we really need to have that iron and blood flowing through us. The iron and blood really need to transform all the time, constantly transforming. And that reminds me of a paper I read by Elena Valusi, and she was writing about female alchemy in an article. The article was, was quite interesting. It was called Blood, Tigers, Dragons, The Physiology of Transcendence for Women. And it was about how we envision the female body over time. What are the what are the more ancient and cultural perceptions on the female body, on its processes, on its fluids, for example, the language that's used and the way that, you know, what is the role of a woman's blood, blood basically? And she referred to the purpose of female alchemy being transcendence. And this was partly characterized by the regular transformation of blood as blood transforms into chi energy in female alchemy, it also transforms into energy for us in modern biomedical perspectives, where iron facilitates delivery of oxygen to cells and enables metabolism of glucose to eventually form energy, just another alchemical process in a way. It's very interesting to look at people like that who've gone back in time and had a look at how we write about women's conditions and how we see the purpose as well of various things like the menstrual cycle. And iron is such an integral part of our blood. It's partly how we embody the qualities of yin, the female essence, being more cool in nature, more still, more introspective, receptive, more gentle. If you think about iron, it's it's a mineral element, it's silver gray, it's very dark, it's solid, strong, and it's cool. And these are all qualities of yin. And it arrives in the blood with each bleeding cycle as a reminder that we're regularly letting go of it. So there is the transcendence and the transformation. 
and a reminder that we need to replenish it. Yin is earth and iron as a metal makes up 5% of the earth's crust. It's the second most abundant metal on earth. Now, of course, men will have their yin aspects as well, but yin will predominate the formation and development of the female form. Because of this constitutional connection with iron and blood, the pathway to healing a woman's body, regardless of the complaints, I believe, should always begin with nourishing her blood, including restoring deficient iron levels. This is how we breathe life into our tissues, cells, and organs. So let's first look now at how you would determine if your iron levels are low. And then I want to give you some practical diet tips to get you started on building and nourishing your blood and iron if you happen to uh, be low in iron. And even if you're not, you can still use these tips for maintaining healthy blood and iron status. Okay, so why would you have uh, iron deficiency? Because we need to talk about testing and so on, but it's worth also thinking about why you would be in that situation in the first place. So there are several reasons why your iron levels or your ferritin levels may have tested low recently. So those two names might ring a bell because you might have seen them on a recent blood test. So the top cause of iron deficiency or low ferritin is that the diet isn't providing enough iron. So you need a certain amount of iron daily just for energy, immune function, and also for menstrual cycle health. For women who menstruate or women between the ages of 18 to 50, the requirement is actually quite high. So it sits around the 18 milligrams per day mark. So that's what you're really needing, somewhere up to 18 milligrams a day. And for women after menopause, it goes down to about eight milligrams daily. And so it just changes because of the menstrual cycle, you know, not really incurring that loss of iron each menstrual cycle. So you might not be getting enough iron in your diet. It's possible also that your diet may not be nutritious enough in general. So that's something that I can definitely help you with or a nutritionist can help you with this. But you want to have a diet that's giving you, you know, even not just iron, but all of the cofactors that help you absorb the iron and all of the vitamins and minerals that you need to be healthy and have great healthy hormonal systems. So diet may be a bit lacking in that respect. And vegan and vegetarian diets can be quite problematic for iron levels because you're thinking here, not only iron, maybe B12, and maybe also absorption issues. So if there's vegan or vegetarian diet plus absorption issues, then it's going to be quite hard to get the iron in through the diet. Now, the second cause is um, for everybody not absorbing the iron that you're taking in. So this could be due to issues with your gut membrane health. Think about conditions like celiac disease and chronic gastritis. These are typical conditions where the lining of the gut and the gastrointestinal system is not doing very well. It's leading you into a state of malabsorption. So it's a malabsorption syndrome. If you think about celiac or gastritis, that's become chronic. And it'll often not just affect your uh, iron levels, but it affects your absorption of all different types of nutrients. And it's realistic to think if you had a condition like celiac disease or chronic gastritis or malabsorption issues, that you would definitely be feeling tired, undernourished, you'd be feeling stressed out uh, physically. So you'd have a lot of these symptoms that are making you feel just generally unwell anyway. Gastric bypass surgery, that's another one that could be a cause of low iron absorption. And if you have a chronic gut condition, you also want to make sure that you're not bleeding from the gut, which is a surefire way to lose iron. And actually chronic gut bleeding, that's the number one cause of poor absorption of iron. I'll also mention here that the duodenum is really quite specific when it comes to iron absorption. That's where it happens. So if you happen to have issues with your small intestine, that's going to be problematic. Now, this is one of the pulses that I will often read when my clients come in and I'm assessing them through pulse diagnosis. The small intestine pulse can often give some insights here into what's happening. And I'll have a look also at how the, uh, the middle of the body is performing. So that's basically your digestive system and liver and pancreas. So pulse diagnosis can be really useful here as well. 
Also, of course, all of the pathology testing can be incredibly useful as well because you're trying to assess the gut lining. We can't see it. We can't feel it. So we need to rely on markers of intestinal damage, intestinal permeability and things like that. Also microbiome. We need to rely on those things to tell us what's happening internally. So the third cause that relates to women, um, in this case in the fertile years, losing iron is that we're menstruating, we lose iron with every cycle. And as we move through certain life stages, um, certain events, they're going to impact our iron even more. So you may be a woman who's become pregnant or a woman who's experiencing heavy bleeds. You might be a woman who's going through perimenopause, which is a time when estrogen can become quite fluctuating and volatile. So at the times when your estrogen's really surging, you can start having heavy bleeds as well. According to a 2023 review, iron loss is a universal event for menstruating women and girls. It's chronic, it's there, and it's happening to a lot of us. And that's it for part one of Natural Approach to Iron Deficiency, Nourishing the Sea of Blood. Come back soon for part two. We'll be looking at iron testing, iron supplementation, and iron through the diet. Hey, everybody, please know that the information, opinion, and advice provided in this podcast are not intended to replace professional medical care. They are for general information and educational purposes only. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast may not always be those of the host. Thanks for listening.